I hope you understand that he, he gets all the credit, he gets all the glory, he gets all the praise. It's all of him, nothing of us. Everything we have and are is because of Christ. And without him, Jesus said in John 15, without me, you can do how much? Yeah, that uh, that's, translates into zero. <laughs> So he gets all the the praise and, you know, we talk about heaven quite a bit and pastor's right. We talk about the rapture and prophecy and stuff like that. And I'm telling you, when we get to heaven, it's going to be something else. Um, Max Lucado wrote a book uh, a while ago, uh, The Applause from Heaven or in Heaven. And I forget what the title was, but... uh, I hope Max understands that that applause is not for me. It's not for you. That applause is for Christ. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, All the glory goes to Christ. It's all about him, not us. Yeah. All right. Well, um, Pastor did something wonderful for me um, over the last few months. And you folks get the same blessing that I do, but I think uh, you get this little email that says, pray for so-and-so and pray for so-and-so. You get, all of you get that? I believe you do. Well, at least I do. I just want you to know something, that when I get these emails, I actually pray for the people even though I may not know them. I, I pray for them. So uh, I hope you understand that that's not wasted. That, that is really... When I get these emails, I take them very seriously. And I'm glad that the pastor's doing that. But he's a special friend anyway. And um, Friday is our day when he can, when he's not busy. We go to McDonald's and we have some good coffee. Yeah, I just go up to the counter and said, I need my senior coffee. And uh, we do the same. We just have a great time of fellowship together. And I look forward to Friday mornings. I really do. It's like a breath of fresh air in the middle of the week. And we have a great time of fellowship. Well, um, we live in prophetic days. I guess I need not tell you that. You understand we live in very significant days, very prophetic days. And uh, tonight I uh, produced a little sheet for you because I think we need to understand the one book that most people consider a very significant prophetic book in the Bible. It's the book of Revelation. Revelation. Not revelations, plural, but revelation singular. And uh, you all have a, a copy of this sheet? I'm, I'm sure you do. Pastor, here I'm making Pastor work. He'd like to sit down and just relax. That's what I like to do, sit down and relax and let another pastor just preach at me. But... Um, We're putting him to work tonight. Many have come to me in the last few years, and uh, I shouldn't say many, but a number of people, and have said something like this. I I don't understand the book of Revelation. I just don't understand. It's too hard. And usually what I'll ask them is a a very simple question. Well, have you read it? (laughs) Is that a good question to ask? Have you read it? I mean, it's got to be hard if you haven't read it. You've got to read it. And then, of course, if they say, yeah, I try to read it, but it's hard to understand, then uh, I, I'll say something, well, well, you know, let's understand it at, at face value. Whatever it says, let's take it at face value. Uh, matter of fact, the, the, this is a book that John wrote. He wrote five books in the New Testament, five. And this is the last of his writings. And when this book was finalized, when he wrote the last, when he penned the last few words, that was the last of divine revelation. God gave no more divine revelation. That was it. And so we come to the book of Revelation. That's the last book in the Bible. So when we come to this book, it's a, a basically a very prophetic book. And it, interestingly enough, the outline of this book is found right in the first chapter. You, you can find the outline. And I, I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, and you'll see the outline in 
in verse 19. There, there is a divinely given outline in this chapter. And this chapter will tell you, this verse will tell you what's in the rest of the book. So, actually Jesus says uh, to John, write the things which you have seen. And that will consider to be chapter 1. John is writing down the things that he had seen. In chapters 2 and 3, the things which are. And at that time, it's the seven churches of the book of Revelation. In chapters 2 and 3, as a matter of fact, do you know in what present country these seven churches are located? Do you have any clue what country? They're not in Israel, by the way. Does anybody know? I know pastor would know. It begins with the letter T, and it's north of Israel. Anybody have another clue? You need another clue? T U. Right. And Turkey is right next to Greece. So there you have greasy Turkey. Wow, well, we won't go into that. I'm just trying to find ways to remember where is what. But anyway, these seven churches are found in the western part of Turkey. A lot of biblical action takes place in the country of Turkey. For example, the ark landed in the mountains, plural. It's a mountain range of what? Ararat. Ararat. Right. That's eastern Turkey. That's eastern Turkey. So we have quite a bit of biblical stuff happening in the country of Turkey. All right. So the things which are, that's the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. And finally, you have the things which will take place after this. All the way from chapters 4 through chapter 22. That's a very simple little outline. And I have it for you on this sheet. A very simple little outline. You look at the middle of the page, uh, chapter 1, past history, chapters 2 and 3, present reality, and prophetic destiny. Let's uh, skip back to uh, capital letter A where it says, the first reflection is on its outlook. What is the outlook of the book of Revelation? Because this will give us a little idea about what this book is all about before we proceed with the outline. First of all, I'd like you to notice that this book is not about John. It's not about John the Apostle or John the Beloved. And you, you do make a distinction between John the Beloved and John the Baptist, right? You know that there's a difference. John the Baptist literally lost his head, literally. This is John the Beloved or John the Apostle who writes these five New Testament books or letters. So that's who it is. And in chapter 1, verse 1, this is the revelation of, about Jesus Christ. It's about him. So this is known as a Christological, meaning Christ-centered, Christ study, it's a study of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of my favorite hymns is Jesus Shall Reign Where'er the Sun. Are you familiar with that hymn? It's an old hymn. Jesus Shall Reign Where'er the Sun. Does his transgressive journeys run? Um, it's a great hymn. And basically what the hymn is saying, that history belongs to Christ. The end belongs to Jesus Christ. It's all about him. Nobody is going to win except the Lord Jesus Christ. That last chapter has already been written. It's not going to change. God will not change that. So this is a Christological book about Christ's person, position, and power. It is also, here's a fat, big fat word for you, eschatological. That's a huge word. Basically, it means things about the future things about the future, or prophecy. What began in Genesis is now going to conclude in Revelation. And now we have the 
completion and the revelation of what John, of what Daniel said earlier was concealed up for a certain time, now it's going to be revealed to us in fullness. And that's why we have the book of Revelation. It tells us what the future holds. And many people today on the street, they are curious as to what is going to happen. They're curious, they would like to know what will take place in the future. All they have to do is consult the Word of God. Because God already says through prophets like Daniel and Zechariah and uh, John, the beloved, he already has told us what the future holds. So we want to look at exactly what we'll find here. We talked about past history, present reality, and now I'd like to take a, a little bit more time developing what, will you, what you will have in, in chapters 4 through 22. Um, when, I, when I was younger, when I was a younger lad, when I was a, a younger boy, um, I always thought that the book of Revelation was about heaven. But you know something? I was wrong. Many people think that's what this book is all about. This book is not all about heaven. As a matter of fact, there are only four chapters in this book that deal with what we call heaven. Chapters 4 and 5 have to do with heaven. And chapters 21 and 22 have to do with the eternal state. If you want to know what it's going to be like in eternity, then you will go to chapters 21 and 22, and it'll tell you this is what you will find in eternity. I mean, I, we could spend a long time looking at what's coming in eternity and, and the blessings of it. it um, First Corinthians, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul says something like this, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor had, has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. In other words, even though the Bible has already given us a little light on heaven, you have no clue what's coming. It's going to be that good. It's going to be beyond words. Paul was called into the third heaven. Do you remember in 2 Corinthians? And he said, he said, I can't describe it for you. I mean, it's unlawful for me to tell you what I saw. So what's coming is beyond a dictionary's ability to describe. And it's coming because God said so. So when you come to chapters 4 and 5, it's about heaven. And by the way, let me give you let me give you two words that describe heaven in these two chapters. Two words. They both begin with the letter T. The letter T like in Thomas. Okay? T. The first thing that you'll see in heaven is going to be a throne. A throne. That is going to be the central focus of heaven. The throne and the one who sits on it. And that's God and, of course, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the throne is one of the major visions that John sees about heaven. So when I think about heaven, well, it's nice to think of the fact that my knee won't be hurting me anymore. My back won't be aching anymore. No more migraines, no more this and no more hospitals no more funeral homes, no more loss of loved ones, etc., etc., etc. But when I think of heaven, I really need to focus on the fact, here I'm going to see God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. I'm going to be in the immediate presence of God, and he's going to be seated on that throne. Now, that's an amazing thing. So that's the first thing we'll see in heaven. But there's another T that we'll see in heaven, and that's called the temple. 
There is a temple there. And you'll read about it in Revelation chapters 21 and 22. So, those are the two T's. So when we come to chapters 4 and 5, this is God's throne. Heaven. It's a place where God dwells. Now we come to the major portion of the book. And this is interesting. How in the world do we have the entire, the entire portion, all the way from chapter 6 through chapter 19, verse 10, not dealing with heaven and glory and splendor and power and brilliance of God, but what we have in chapter 6 through chapter 19, verse 10, is the worst time in all of human history. The majority, the major portion of this book has to do with seven years of the worst time in all of human history. And it is still future and it's coming. We're right now what we're seeing, and I think you will agree, we're just seeing the beginning of it. The birth pangs. That's all we're seeing. We, uh, uh, let me use bad English. We ain't seen nothing yet. And let me tell you something else. I won't be here to see what's going to happen because I believe that the Lord will rapture us out before the tribulation period. We're going to be gone as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to talk to you about this seven year period because this is what the major portion of this book is all about. Would you be so kind and turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel. Just before the Minor Prophets, you come to the book of Daniel. Chapter 12. And look at the first verse, if you, if you would be so kind. At that time, Michael shall stand up. He's a very powerful angel. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Now what is Michael's primary function? To defend, to protect the people of Israel, the Jewish people. And I'm so proud, I'm so glad that we have both flags up tonight. <laughs> that flag, that blue and white, that's the, that's the flag of Israel, by the way. I, I think most of you know that. And I'm so glad that you love the Jewish people. God will bless you for it. He will. He guarantees that. At that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, notice what it says, such as never was since there was a nation. Never was since there was a nation. Even to that time, and at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who's found written in the book. Well, you might say, you know, um, well, that sounds like Israel's really going to get it. Well, would you please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. Matthew, chapter 24. This is sometimes known as the Olivet Discourse. And it was given where? On the Mount of... That's why they call it Olivet. Olives. Yeah. By the way, I happen to like olives. I don't know about you. But I go by Giant Eagle sometimes, and I see this table spread full of that olive stuff. Have you ever seen that? But they're a little crazy. They want $9 a pound. And so I get the canned ones. You know, it's only a buck a can. That's better, yeah. Well, this is the Olivet Discourse. And my, my personal understanding of this passage is that most of it has to do with the tribulation period. Right off the bat, beginning with verse 3 and so on. But some of these things will 
you know, already transpire by way of the birth pangs that we talked about a little earlier. But look at what it says in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21. So you don't think that only the Jewish people are going to be severely damaged, devastated. Look at chapter 24, verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since when? Since the beginning of the world. Until this time, nor nor ever shall be. Now, may I, may I suggest to you that the world has never experienced such devastation and such trouble as is coming. And it is coming. You can bank on it. You, you can, I, I, I tell you, God's word is sure and true. And th nothing that can be done to avert this, it's going to happen. It's already in the initial stages, the introductory stages. If you think the world is bad now, you don't want to be around to see what's coming. The worst time in all of human history, and I think this is the reason that God has spent from chapter 6 all the way through chapter 19 to tell the world what is coming. And beyond that, if and indeed this is true, then we have a responsibility to do something about it. I, I tell you uh, that there is a song that says something like this, work for the night is coming when we can work no more. And the time is now for us as Christians to get the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news that Jesus Christ buried, was buried, he died, he was buried, he rose again, and he was seen by over 500 people after his resurrection. We need to get that good news out to tell people, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And you better do it before it's too late. The two worst words in all of human history. Too late. Too late. So here we have the worst time in human history. And it will only last for how long? Precisely, not a day longer and not a day shorter, seven years. I wouldn't want to be around even for one day of those seven years. People are going to cry out for the rocks to fall upon them. People will attempt to kill themselves and somehow will be unable to do so. That's how bad things will be. Because that is the time when God's wrath is going to be poured out on an unbelieving world. And our problem in America today is that we have categorically rejected Jesus Christ. We have jettisoned him out of our system, and we're going to pay a price for that. You cannot get rid of Jesus Christ and ask for him to protect and bless you. Perhaps God bless America should read, America bless God. And not any God but the God of the Bible, and only the God of the Bible. So we have the tribulation period, and in your notes you'll see STBA. You, you see those letters? What in the world does that stand for? Well, let me, let me share with you. Uh, I have this in my notes. But um, what's going to happen in this tribulation period, according to the book of Revelation, first of all, you'll have seven seals. Those are seven seal judgments. You have that in chapter 6. Seven seal judgments. Well, if the S stands for seal judgments, then the T stands for what? Trump. Pets. Yes, exactly, judgments, seven of those. And if that stands for trumpets, then the B stands for bow judgments. 
STB, seal, trumpets, bowls. Now actually, there are not seven, seven, and seven, because the seventh seal judgment turns out to be the next set of judgments. So you actually have six judgments. The seventh trumpet judgment develops into the next seven bowl judgments. So you actually have 19 major judgments in the tribulation period. And what you read, these are all, by the way, they're cumulative in effect. I mean, a, a third of the sea turns into blood, a third of the rivers turn into blood, and you've got frogs, and you've got this, and you've got that, and the trees are burned up, and it, it is a horrendous time. We don't have time tonight to, to develop what all takes place. But Revelation chapters 6 through 19, verse 10, develops it for us. But that's not all that happens. Finally, you see the letter A there, S-T-B-A. It all culminates in the campaigns, plural, of Har Megiddo, the Valley of Megiddo, better known as the Battle of Armageddon, where the nations of the world have come together. And by the way, you say, how are they going to get all these millions of people down into the valley of Armageddon, Armageddo. How are they all going to fit down there? You have to remember something. That by the end of the tribulation period, when Armageddon takes place, more than half of this world's population is dead. They're gone. They're dead. So, if you're worried about a population explosion... The population, half of the world's population is gone. And now we have about 7 billion, I believe, on the face of the earth. More than half of that are going to be gone. There may be 3 billion people left on the face of the earth, perhaps. Perhaps we're being a little too generous, I don't know. So you have these seal judgment, trumpet judgment, bowl judgments and culminating with Armageddon. The seal judgments in chapter 6, the trumpet judgments in chapters 8, 9, and 11. 8, 9, and 11 for the trumpets. The bowl judgments, chapters 15 and 16. And then chapter 16, verse 16, is Armageddon. Now there's another way to divide up this outline as to what you will find in the tribulation period. Let me give you a three-point outline as to what you will find in the tribulation period. In chapters 6 through 11, that's the first half of the tribulation. Chapters 6 through 11, the first half. In chapters 12 through 14, you have the middle of the tribulation. Chapters 12 through 14, the middle of the tribulation. Chapters 15 through 19, verse 10, what, what is your guess? The last half of the tribulation. Okay, so that's an easy way to understand it. Do you, do you understand tonight, do you understand why God spends so many verses and chapters focusing on seven years when you would think that the last book of the Bible would spend all its time on heaven or on eternity, on that which is a blessing. No, the world has to understand that God's wrath is going to be poured out and watch out when God gets angry. Watch out. All you have to do is read chapters like Psalm 2. When his wrath is stirred up, watch out. You don't want to mess with God. And you especially don't want to mess with the God of Israel. You don't want to mess with him. Jesus shall reign. Where'er the sun. 
Well, in chapters 19, 11, and I, I invite you to turn to Revelation 19. We don't really have all the time to look at all these passages. Uh, it, I think Pastor told me tonight, I, I believe, Pastor Carmen, you mentioned you a couple of years ago, you spent time um, in this book, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, even, even if you spend a year or two on this book, it, it's... It, there's a lot there, and you could spend the rest of your life uh, studying this portion of uh, divine revelation. When you come to uh, chapter 19, verse 11, and by the way, notice the last few words of verse 10. For the testimony of Jesus is what? The spirit of prophecy. Prophecy is all about Jesus. Let's never forget that. This book is all about Jesus. As a matter of fact, Luke chapter 24 says, all portions of the Old Testament, there were three major portions of the Old Testament, right? There was the Torah, right? There was the prophets and the writings. The entire Old Testament is about whom? It's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about him. All right. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great London preacher of the mid-19th century, he said it's all about Christ. And his was to preach Christ. And Christ he preached. And the Bible is full, about, full of reference to the Son of God the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 11, Now I saw heaven opened. Behold a white horse. This is not the same white horse that we have in chapter 6. Remember the four horses of the apocalypse? I believe Billy Graham wrote a book about that many, many years ago, the four horses of Revelation or something like that. This is a different writer in a different horse. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. If you're looking for truth, you will only find it in Christ. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Watch out. Here comes God, the second person of the triunity, the Lord Jesus Christ, out of heaven, riding on a white horse. His eyes were like a flame of fire. He is angry. He is bringing judgment with him. And on his head were many crowns. We sing, crown him with what? With many crowns. The lamb upon his throne. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. What does that speak about? His crucifixion. And his name is called the Word of God. You see, the reason he's called the Word of God is because he's God's final message to man. That's what. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. I think this is the first time in my life that I will venture to get on a horse. I usually, I like horses, but at a distance. I don't want to get too close. When I came to this country, I came from Germany in 1962, and we lived out in... Um, what is it called? Outside of Philadelphia, Bucks County, you know. And we lived out there on a farm. Um, it was a part of the China Inland Mission at that time, I think, is who owned the territory. And there, there was a farm, and, and my job, of course, was uh, to work on the farm. My, we had to come over here because my brother is physically handicapped. He's had seven major surgeries on his head. And so we had to come over here because they weren't as advanced in Germany in those years with that kind of surgery. So we lived on this farm, and on the farm there, there were pigs and 
One of my jobs was to clean out the pig's thigh, and I learned real quick that you always carry a pitchfork with you for obvious reasons. I don't know if you've ever worked with pigs, but... Uh, yeah, you pair of boots. And those, those 2,000 pounders that'll nail you against the wall, they will. So I grabbed my pitchfork and I, I, I knew what to do with it. And they knew not to bother me. But uh, my buddy was out there and there was this old Belgian. You know what a Belgian? It's almost like a Clydesdale. These things, they weigh, I mean, they weigh a lot. They're big Belgian horses. And he kept poking the thing with a stick. Kept teasing the horse. And I stood at a distance and I said, Jack, leave that thing alone. That thing's going to kick you. So I left, went into the house, and a few minutes later, I hear the sirens, the ambulance. That horse had taken a hoof and punched him right in the stomach, and his intestines came out. He got, he got, he really got it. Thank the Lord he survived. But that's what causes me to stay at a distance. One of these days I'm going to ride this white one here. See, one of these white ones. I don't know if I'll have a pick of them or not. But he's coming back. Out of his mouth, verse 15, goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress, notice, of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. People should have learned from history that you don't mess with God, especially not the God of Israel. And when you're going to mess with God, at the end, you're going to get it. And you wish you hadn't. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings. And Lord of Lords, one of the most majestic pieces of music written in all times, and this is an opinion I have, was Handel's Messiah. I think it's a majestic piece of music. If you like music, you will appreciate that as one of the great pieces of all of music history. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings. These are kings that had gathered together at Armageddon to fight against Jesus Christ. The flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against whom? Against him who sat on the horse and against his army. They're gathered together and they want to fight God. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet. The beast is the Antichrist. The false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, those who worship his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. What a, what a sight, what a spectacle to see, to behold. I'm glad I'm going to be with Christ, not against him. Yeah. Well, in chapter 20, you have the millennium. Folks, I take this to mean a literal thousand-year reign of Jesus as we know years today. 365 days, thousand years long, Jesus will reign from Jerusalem. And David will be the king under Jesus Christ, reigning and ruling from the Jerusalem area. And this is called the Davidic kingdom, the millennium, the kingdom age. And I uh, wish we had time to develop that. Uh, read some of the Old Testament prophets like Isaiah to see what it's going to be like in the millennium. Ezekiel, some of the other prophets refer to that. So God's throne, God's terror, God's triumph, God's territory, the millennium, 
And finally, God's time. Eternity. God's time. We want to turn to chapter 22, verse 21, uh, by way of conclusion. Pastor, I don't know. I think I was supposed to be done sooner than this. I'm not sure. Would you, would you, um, would it be okay with you? We had like a little question and answer Q&A at the end for a few minutes. Uh, we could do that perhaps if that's all right. Um, 2221, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The last words of scripture. And folks, I, I don't know about you, but I need a lot of God's grace. And it's only the grace of God that's going to see us through the next few days and weeks and years. If we are here that long. I trust that you know Christ as your personal Savior. Because you don't want to think about being too late. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be saved. Today is the day of salvation. And when you trust him, what does he do? He gives you grace for every day living. He gives you hope for the future. Someday soon, and Pastor and I talk about it very often, we love to talk prophecy. We sit there, sipping a cup of coffee, and we talk prophecy. Jesus is coming again. And may he give you all the grace that you need, plus in days to come, till he comes back for us and we hear the trumpet. Some of you know Ray Naviglia. He comes to our Bible study. We have a little Bible study. And, but he does a ram's horn. And I know Pastor plays a real one. This guy just does it with his lips. It's the cheaper version of a real ram's horn. Just to remind us that Jesus is coming back soon. So uh, I thought tonight, uh, you know, we could just do a little something to help you understand what you will find in this book. And I hope that you will, with notes in hand, perhaps you will uh, have meditation in the book of Revelation. You will see what's coming. And I trust that it will give you a passion for the lost. I, I, the Lord has uh, enabled me to go to a few churches to, to give a presentation. And I ask, one of the questions I ask is, how many folks in the congregation have loved ones about whom they're not sure regarding their salvation or about whom they know that they're not saved? And usually, 100% of the hands go up. Everybody as somebody in a family, a family member, a loved one, a relative, a neighbor, somebody who you work with, somebody who you go shopping with, everybody knows of somebody that's close to you. Those folks are on their way to eternal destruction. And that's why it's imperative that we do something about it. You know? And some of you I know are faithful with distributing gospel tracts. You're faithful with talking about the Lord. You, you go and tell others, and God bless you for that. May, uh, may we fill up the rest of the time doing all we can while we can.